hello students. In this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion of science and society and talk about public perceptions of science and scientists. Let's admit it. We often see science as shrouded or complicated, and we see or we envision scientists as being nerdy or stuffy or strange, perhaps even evil, and usually as men in white coats. What I show on this slide is an interesting uh, results of an interesting study done at Fermilab, which is a high energy physics research laboratory near Chicago, where they ask visiting seventh graders to draw and describe a scientist, their view of a scientist, before they visited the lab and then after the lab. The drawing on the left, as you might imagine, is a student's perception before visiting Fermilab, where he describes his view of a scientist in the following way. I think of scientists as being very dedicated to their work. A scientist is bald with hair growing out both sides of his head. He is kind of crazy, talks always quickly, is constantly getting new ideas. He's always asking questions and can be annoying. Well, after their visit to Fermilab, the same student drew the second picture and described the scientist as following. I know scientists are just normal people and lead normal lives. They are interested in dancing, pottery, jogging, and even racquetball. Being a scientist is just another job and can be very exciting. Now, the image of scientists that we see on TV these days can include such characters as Abby Suchow and Sheldon Cooper, a fairly unconventional pair, though maybe nerdy still applies. But this modern image is not universal or pervasive. There is still the image of a scientist in a white lab coat and being a stuffy old man, usually a white man, still being a person who is kind of crazy, talks fast, and can ask a lot of annoying questions. Right? Well, in the last video, I talked about how the zenith of science's standing in society probably came in the mid to late 60s with the landing of the man on the moon. But since that time, there has been a growing disconnect between the scientific community and most of society. Consider the following quote from a noted British scientist and intellectual, C.P. Snow. And yes, this is not the same Professor Proton. C.P. Snow wrote in one of his books, Once or twice I have been provoked and have asked the company of highly educated intellectuals how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold. It was also negative. Yet I was asking something which is about the scientific equivalent of have you read a work of Shakespeare's? Of course, as a non-scientist, C.P. Snow's comments and perhaps those of other scientists, may appear to be elitist or snobbish. After all, with all the advances in science, how is an ordinary member of society, someone like you, supposed to remain reasonably informed? How are you supposed to keep abreast of quantum mechanics and cosmology and nuclear medicine and cancer research and high energy physics and new synthetic materials and on and on and on? Maybe the deficiency is in the educational system itself, and the way we teach science to non-scientists, and of course it's a result of just the rapid advance of knowledge in science. So undoubtedly there is this knowledge gap between scientists and non-scientists, but this, is, this type of gap is found with all disciplines as they become more and more specialized. How can any individual be well educated in literature as well as in the arts and in business and in medicine? It's the very nature of our educational system that at some point we specialize. We major in a narrow discipline. But still, the goal of a college education should be to instill a certain level of general understanding of scientific concepts and a certain degree of self-learning skills to all students, even if that understanding is just a big picture level. This is the purpose of this course. So those of you who had the first semester of this course, no doubt, know the second law of thermodynamics and, and can discuss it at a dinner party, right? Second law, in a spontaneous process, there is an increase in, remember, in disorder of the universe. Uh, or in other words, S happens, and you remember what S stands for? No, 
S stands for entropy, right? Second law of thermodynamics. Okay, on to another topic about science and society or public opinion about science. Um, we are enamored with opinion polls, which can be, in some cases, an anathema of science. Here's a cartoon depicting the situation faced by our dear friend and early scientist Galileo, where he was approached by a group of clergy saying that the polls say 79% of the people say that the earth is flat. But polls can also provide some interesting insights about public perceptions of institutions, including science. The National Opinion Research Center from the University of Chicago, which is something like the Gallup polls, has conducted a survey from 1973 on every other year of people's confidence in various institutions, including the scientific community. So if the public's trust in science was at its zenith in maybe the 60s, we see that there has been a gradual erosion or decline of this confidence in science from 1973 on, as shown in this slide, where the left is the percentage of respondents who indicated that they had a high level of confidence in science. So this decline is from maybe up or 40 percent to just a little bit above 40 percent in, in, in the current day. But this decline or this erosion actually is much more modest than the public's confidence in several other major institutions of our society. This slide shows similar results of this poll for the public's perception comparing science to medicine and organized religion and education. And you can see that in these other cases, the erosion or the decline in confidence is actually much greater than it has been for science. Similarly, the confidence in banks and financial institutions has dropped greatly, and there has been a large decline in confidence in the press and TV. I haven't shown this, but you can imagine there is an even larger decline in the public's confidence in the three branches of government, and the only institution of this type for which there has been an increase in confidence has been the military. So, to reiterate, though there has been a gradual drop in the public's confidence in science, this drop has actually been less than that for other institutions of society. So, it's one of these glasses half full situations about public perception of science. Another consideration is the intrinsic different world views of various disciplines or other major segments of society. There's an interesting book written by Mooney and Kirschenbaum called The Unscientific American, where they contrast the worldview of scientists and politicians, or scientists and business leaders, or scientists and religious leaders, scientists and journalists, or people in the communication industry, or scientists and those in Hollywood and the entertainment industry. Now, many of you will go into these other segments of society. You are likely majoring in business or journalism or accountancy or political science. The point that the authors make in this book is that for these other disciplines, the approaches are just different than the approach of science, and that these differences can be a source of misunderstanding, if not mistrust or conflict. Let me take one example, the difference in the cultures of science and journalism. Now, the reason for selecting journalism is, you may or may not know this, but after you leave the educational system, you know, K-12 and then college education, the main source of information you will receive has been generated or filtered through journalists. Nearly 40% of the public say that they obtain the main source of their information from television, and then that is followed by the internet and print media. In each of these cases, journalists have a hand in preparing the content that is delivered to the public. Yet the relationship between journalists and scientists is not so strong. Now, some of this is due to the lack of coverage that scientists perceive they get from journalism. Uh, in a 2008 study, only 1% of the front page stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal were about science and technology.
But what is interesting is that both fields, science and journalism, have the goal of finding truth and disseminating truths to the public. They share a mission, finding truth and disseminating this to the public. However, their approaches are entirely different. Media coverage by journalists is episodic and event-driven. The news cycle, since they have to catch the attention of the reader, the viewer, they value things that are hot. Science, on the other hand, is an ongoing, drawn out, fairly slow process which values reproducibility and consensus building. Now, readers, we in the public, can experience whiplash. Is one glass of wine good for me or bad for me? Does global warming increase the incidence of hurricanes or not? Journalism often pursues a storyline to make a human interest connection. In contrast, science tries to be impersonal. Results should be reproducible by anyone who has the ability to conduct the experiment. Science considers alternative explanations, not just the sexy attention-grabbing explanation. Journalism often tries to portray opposite or alternative views. You watch cable news networks. They will cover both sides of a story, even if one side is very weak or minor, in order to root out some controversy and drive up the ratings. They will give equal coverage to the proponents and to the skeptics. Whereas science attempts to build consensus, a scientist may be cautious in giving an explanation, for example in a TV interview, until it is supported by others in the field to avoid maybe damaging their own reputation or, or just in deference to the way science is done. To a journalist, this hesitancy among scientists may seem like equivocation or hedging. In journalism, the story has to be presented very briefly, sound bites and with appeal. Whereas for a scientist to thoroughly explain a complicated scientific topic, it usually takes more air time or column space, often with the use of math and equations and graphs. Journalism also has to cover other areas, which includes politics and entertainment, for example, so that if a topic such as climate change is not supported by politicians in the political season, the topic is likely to get less attention. This, of course, irks scientists who think that the topic should be presented to the public regardless of what a presidential candidate or a talk show host thinks about the topic. Lastly, the slow death of newspapers or print journalism has further caused a division between journalism and science. Newspapers have tried to be more balanced and to serve local and regional constituencies and to devote more time actually to science and technology. But print journalism is slowly dying, being replaced by TV and internet based journalism. And in contrast, online outlets tend to cater to particular audiences and this often leads to unbalanced coverage. So this is one example of the different cultures that can exist between different professional areas or segments of society, and how even two disciplines that have similar goals, finding the truth and disseminating to the public, can have greatly different approaches. Now in this brief comparison of the worldview of journalism versus science, I indirectly describe some of the characteristics of the scientific method. What I show on this slide are a list of several of these characteristics of the scientific process or the scientific method. In one of the future video lessons, I will go over these in more detail. So I'm just very briefly showing them here. It's a collaborative process and it requires or involves reproducibility of results, open dialogue and sharing of data. It's consensus building. It uses reasoning processes, uses mathematical tools. It relies on measurements and quantitative methods. It involves objective approaches, and that ob those objective approaches do include skepticism, and involves the use of controls and variables. As I said, we will talk about the scientific method in greater detail in one of the future video lessons. But we will also talk about these characteristics in the chapters that we cover, the content that we cover in this course. For example, we will talk about how it took a long time for Alfred Wegener to gain support from colleagues for his ideas regarding continental drift.
which we now describe in terms of plate tectonic theory, but the point is it took a long time to build a consensus in, for some of these explanations. So to summarize the, what we've covered so far, society depends significantly on advances in science and technology. Just look at the devices that you're carrying with you, that you're viewing this lesson with, look at what's in your medicine cabinet, look at your modes of transportation, etc. But the public's perception of science and scientists has no doubt waxed and waned over the decades. But we as consumers and as voters need to have some basic understanding of scientific principles, how science is done, so that we can be better consumers. A goal of this course, again, is to enable you, a non-scientist, to gain this big picture view of science and technology and to be able to evaluate the validity and the role of science and technology in your life. Now we will pause and I want you to do a little assignment to bring to the next class. We've talked about online resources and of which there seems to be um, about maybe 1.5 gazillion. The point is that online sources of information can come in various levels of veracity and completeness and level of coverage. How can the consumer, you, know what to trust when you go online, especially when the topic is one that can be controversial? So the assignment is to take one of the topics below, topics that are fairly controversial, pick them to be controversial, and to do a Google search. So pick a topic and what, whichever letter, A, B, C, D, E, comes first in your name. Your first, start with your first name. If it, you have an A in it, then use A, immunizations and autism. I want you to do a Google search of the term. You will no doubt generate several pages of links. And I want you to uh, look at at least four of these and examine the source. That is, is it a .gov, a .org, a .com, something else? That is meaning that it comes from a governmental source, from some organization, some commercial interest. And what is your impression of the fairness and the level of coverage of the topic? Just your impression. Was it written for a high school level audience or a college level audience or a PhD level audience? Does it appear to be biased or to promote an agenda? Just your impression again. Bring a list of these URLs, their titles, and maybe a couple of complete sentences describing each and prepare to discuss these in class. Okay? Now we will pause and you will be asked uh, a few questions before proceeding to the next video lesson. Thanks a lot.